around our parent collaboration, CosmoQuest. Halloween is hands down the most beloved season of the year. Costumes are worn, yards are decorated. We are here for all the strangers that knock on our door, the weirdos, the witches, the oh so very many werewolves. And there will be as much candy as we can afford given out. We know we are not the only ones. With about a week to go, we know that any day now, NASA, ESA, ESO, and all the other agencies will begin releasing their spooky season images. There will be nebula cropped with contrast adjusted just so to reveal witches' hats, and others rotated to reveal ghosts and maybe, I can hope, a goblin or two. We are telling you this. Because in this weird era of too many social media platforms, if you don't know to go looking for spooky season space images, you just might miss those spooky season space images. And the pumpkins. Pretty much every year, the Jet Propulsion Lab, JPL, does a pumpkin carving contest like no other. You need to follow JPL on the socials now to catch all the gordy goodness. I'm telling you all of this today because the, well, I'm already in a Halloween state of mind. And let's face it, we need as much joy as we can find in our current world. Also, our recording schedule is such that we record over the weekend and release midweek. And our next episode will be coming just after Halloween, but it will be recorded before the best images and pumpkins are released. And we just want you to know everything that's going on. Everything. So get ready. Squint your eyes, tilt your head, and find all the ghouls in the galactic plane. It is time to use your pareidolia for good. And if you missed the episode, pareidolia is your brain's ability to see faces and other shapes that aren't actually there in shapes of everyday objects. We did an entire closer look on this last year, and we'll link back to it in the show notes. Now, we have more than spooky season stuff. While this episode is light on the supernatural, it is actually rich in the scientific. From looking at dark matter to what we can learn from things that explode in the distant universe, we explore a lot of very real weird things. We also have rocket news, a touch of earth science, and more right here on Escape Velocity Space News. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am here to put science in your brain. little, I was totally into all of those in search of shows. There are so many cool mysteries in history waiting to be solved. And I love that I've gotten to see some of these great mysteries actually get solved. The giant squid, it's real. Black holes, they are totally real. The ancient pyramids, totally full of hidden rooms. Scientists sometimes get to find pretty awesome stuff. And as an adult, I find there are both old and new mysteries waiting to be solved. Was there life on Mars? Is there life in Europa? Does our solar system have any additional large planets? As I approach my 50th birthday, I find myself wondering just what will be solved in my lifetime. The big planet, the planet nine in the outer solar system, I think that is the most likely to be proven or disproven in the near future. 
In 2016, astronomers Michael Brown and Constantine Batagen proposed the existence of a large world in the outer solar system that has been gravitationally influencing the orbits of small worlds like Sedna that are out there beyond Pluto and Charon. The math seemed to make sense. The data visualization showing how the gravity of some additional large object could affect what we're seeing definitely makes sense. But many years of searching all the existing databases of images and observing campaigns using the NEOWISE satellite and the 8 meter Subaru telescope have all failed to find this theorized world. And folks now have to wonder, could what we see have another cause? Even Brown has been willing to admit, if Planet Nine isn't found by the upcoming Vera Rubin Observatory's survey, they'll need another explanation for what they're seeing. There have already been several papers trying to show how Brown and Buttigieg's interpretation of current observations may be wrong, and a ninth planet may not be needed. And now there is also a paper saying the lack of an observable planet may be evidence that our understanding of gravity may need some work. And to be fair, we know our current theory of gravity works really well for some distances and some masses and some velocities, but not for others. Inside black holes, things break down. And at very large distances, we don't actually know if gravity totally works. This is because of dark matter. Invisible to our standard light detecting sensors, there is stuff out there capable of bending light with its gravity while also, to unknown degrees, altering the orbits of stars and galaxies and galaxies and galaxy clusters and even altering the evolution of our universe as a whole. The reason I say to unknown degrees is because a small change in how gravity works at the largest scales can also explain a lot of what we see. The idea that modified Newtonian gravity can explain how things orbit one another at massive scales without needing dark matter was mathematically developed by Mordechai Milgram in 1983 and has been plugged away at ever since. And now, in a new paper in the Astronomical Journal, written by Catherine Brown and Harsh Mather, researchers test if modified Newtonian gravity, also called MOND, can explain what we can see as well as a ninth planet we haven't seen. The researchers look at our solar system's alignment within the galaxy and determine how that could affect the orbits of dwarf planets in our solar system. To quote from their paper, this population is predicted to cluster in phase space. The orbits should have high eccentricity and a propensity for their minor axes to be perpendicular to the direction of the center of the galaxy. All of these features are known to be exhibited by known Kuiper Belt objects." End quote. According to the paper, this alignment with the center of the galaxy hasn't been previously looked at. They confirm the original result that the alignment of six distant small Sedna-like worlds is statistically unexpected to a large degree. So we have a suite of aligned worlds that both match the presence of a not yet detected large world and match what is expected from the standard formulation of modified Newtonian dynamics. And this is where a lot of us astronomers find ourselves going, huh, Mond over and over and over finds nice consistent ways to keep itself in contention as a possible real part of physics but we don't have a good way to experimentally test it. 
or we haven't had a way until maybe now. This paper correctly points out that when Rubin Observatory starts its survey, more distant worlds should be found. And Mon makes specific predictions about how they should be distributed. This means Rubin has the potential to either find Planet Nine and explain our solar system without needing Mond, or it will find more worlds that align with Mond's expectations. Or we will find evidence of both or neither. The first few years after Rubin Observatory starts delivering data, our understanding of our solar system and potentially the universe beyond is going to rapidly, rapidly get some updates. I can't wait. We've said it before and we'll say it again. The universe is an improv artist that likes to say yes and. I really wouldn't be surprised if the effects we see are due to both the stuff we collectively call dark matter as well as some modification to gravity. To prove that, however, we need to be able to make solid predictions for both how the stuff should act and how the force modification should be observable. In a new paper appearing in Physical Review Letters, researchers led by Dion Nordheis explain how one potential dark matter particle, the axion, should be converted into light when exposed to powerful magnetic fields. This means pulsars with their extreme magnetic fields are a good place to look for the light of axions ceasing to be. The trick is understanding what light comes from the pulsar and any surrounding material and what light comes from axion destruction. That's a lot to decouple. Researchers used the most up-to-date theoretical framework for pulsars to model what light should be coming from non-axion related processes. And then they took very careful observations of 27 nearby pulsars to see if an axion-related excess of light could be seen. Conveniently, any excess should only shine in the radio colors of light, so it is possible to compare all the colors to find a match, and then look for a very specific excess of light in just those radio wavelengths. And within their era, they saw nothing. This isn't to say axions aren't being reduced to light in the environs of pulsars. It is only to say a whole lot of axions aren't producing enough light for us to see it at this time, given the accuracy of our current theories. This doesn't rule out axions as dark matter. It just rules out axions existing in large numbers in pulsars, probably. I mean, we could have errors in pulsar models, our axion models, our dark matter models, or maybe even in our observations. What this does mean is we have something to look at and a rabbit hole to go down as we work to precisely observe and understand our universe. We have a starting point. And that is more than we had before. And it's okay for science theory and observational ability to not always match up. It's frustrating, but it's okay. Our current understanding of the mysterious forces and factors that govern our universe and its evolution is based on the small fraction of the sky we've been able to monitor over either long periods of time or to great depth. To really see what is going on, we need to see how things change over time across vast swaths of the sky. Up until now, that hasn't been possible. But by the end of 2024, the Vera Rubin Observatory hopes to begin a deep space mapping and monitoring survey, officially called the Legacy Survey of Space and Time. This survey will observe the telescope's entire view of the sky every few days down to the faintest of objects. 
This is possible thanks to a design that combines an extremely large field of view, a 3.2 gigapixel camera, and a telescope with an 8.4 meter primary mirror. For roughly 10 years, this system should deliver 15 terabytes of data per night as it monitors the positions and brightnesses of 37 billion stars and galaxies and all the solar system objects that cross through its field. This system has been in the works for nearly a generation, and its results may update our understanding of the universe as radically as the development of the camera. I, for one, can't wait to see what it is capable of and all that we will learn from its data. Provided satellites don't totally ruin the sky. But that's a topic for our closer look. Before we get there, let's turn toward things that explode in the night. Stay tuned. The most important factor about our universe that we should be able to measure is its expansion rate. In 1929, Edwin Hubble provided the first observational evidence of an expanding universe when he demonstrated that galaxies that are further away appear to be moving faster away than nearer galaxies. This is a bit tricky to understand. Imagine you are in a gymnasium set up with a massive grid of desks. If the room is static, the desks all stay the same distance apart and an observer doesn't perceive them to be moving. If, however, the gymnasium is expanding, you might notice that the space in between any two neighboring desks grows, say, two feet a minute. Looking around after two minutes, the desks to your left and right and front and back all have moved four feet. Desks two desks away will have moved four feet for the space between you and the first desk and another four feet for the distance between the first desk and it. That means that slightly further desk moves a total of eight feet in two minutes. The further away the desk you look at, the more space there is to expand, and the faster that distant desk will be carried away by the gymnasium's expansion. If the gymnasium is big enough, bigger than is imaginable for a gym, the space that is expanding could be so vast that a distant desk appears to move as fast or faster than the speed of light. It isn't actually moving that fast. It's just caught up on an expanding surface and all that space getting added, it adds up to things appearing to move away rather rapidly. Now, if the universe is moving apart at a constant rate, we should see a straight line in a plot of distance to an object versus its velocity. Usually this is a galaxy rather than a desk. If the universe is expanding at a slowing or accelerating rate, we'll see that plot have a curve. The problem is that while we can easily measure the apparent motions of galaxies, we can't as easily measure their distance. Ideally, we need something to be shining brightly with a known amount of light. This allows us to compare how luminous we know they are with how bright they appear and calculate the distance to the galaxy or the star or whatever is glowing. The same way our brain automatically estimates the distance by looking at how bright headlights appear. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of extremely bright objects with known luminosities. To measure even moderately distant galaxies, we have just one tape measure, the Type 1a supernovae. When these systems blow, they are expected to give off the same amount of light on average with every explosion, because they have the same amount of fuel going into the explosion. It isn't entirely comfortable to only have one tool, however, and astronomers have been trying to find a another tool for measuring distance for decades. And we might have. 
In a new paper in the journal Astronomy and Astrophysics, researchers led by Albert Snepin showed that a pair of merging neutron stars have extremely symmetric explosions that have a luminosity related to their temperature. No additional calibration is needed. We just look, look at the temperature, and look at the brightness. While these mergers, called kilonovae, are less frequent than supernovae, they can be seen at similarly large distances, and they should be frequent enough that within a few years, we'll know if both methods give us the same results. This will let us know if supernova explosions, which are calibrated using stars, are as accurate as we think, or if we need to rescale our understanding of the universe using these new data points, whatever the result may be. It's nice to know we have a clear path forward. Ultimately, our universe is far more diverse in its reality than humans tend to be in our theorizing. Over and over, we have found remarkable things just by turning a new instrument skyward. From the discovery of cold hydrogen gas in radio to the discovery of flashes of energy in gamma rays. The full expanse of the cosmic electromagnetic spectrum seems to be forever prepared to show us new things that surprise us. According to a new paper from the Hess Collaboration, researchers have detected the highest energy gamma rays ever released by a pulsar while observing the Vela pulsar. This is a neutron star that's spinning rapidly in the center of a nebula. This special kind of neutron star is rapidly rotating and, as we mentioned earlier, has a powerful magnetic field. Electrons caught in this magnetic field can get accelerated. All this energy ultimately can get released as light. Similar observations of the Crab pulsar had also detected extreme gamma ray light, but the new detections of the Vela pulsar are an order of magnitude more energetic. In terms of color, they turned the blue dial to 11 and then just kept turning that dial until they defined something so extreme as to never have been seen from this kind of an object before. I look forward to seeing more pulsar studies from this scope as researchers continue to explore the extremes of the electromagnetic spectrum. To me, it feels like our biggest unknowns are often part of the high energy universe. Those processes and objects rise to the highest temperatures and give off the bluest of light. As an example, back in 2018, researchers discovered an exceedingly luminous, very blue eruption of light that burst forth like it could be a supernova but then faded away faster than any kind of normal stellar explosion. In the past five years, six more of these luminous, fast, blue optical transients have been discovered. And with each new discovery, it doesn't always feel like we're closer to figuring out what these things are. With temperatures of tens of thousands of Kelvin, these objects are most likely some kind of an explosion, and some have suspected they are associated with a super rare kind of supernova. For a while, folks thought they were associated with stellar explosions in star-forming systems. But the newest explosion took place about 50,000 light years from a nearby spiral galaxy and about 15,000 light years from a smaller satellite galaxy in a location nowhere near any kind of star formation. This event has been named the Finch, and it is described in a new paper led by Ashley Crimes that appears in monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. When an explosion occurs in seemingly empty space, it is either going to be associated with a very fast-moving young star that got flung out of a system, or it's going to be associated with a very long-lived kind of an object that escaped a galaxy at a more pedestrian rate. 
In this case, the team speculates that while an unreasonably fast-moving giant star could have exploded in unusual ways, it's also possible that a binary system with a long-lived star and some kind of a compact dead star, like a black hole, could have left one of the galaxies together, moving at normal speeds, and then merged in a harsh flash of blue. This raises an interesting possibility. If all the previously seen luminous fast blue optical transients have been associated with star forming regions, could this be another situation where we are seeing similar patterns of light from very different environments, it's just possible that more than one thing is causing these weird blue events. It turned out that gamma ray bursts, once thought to be one thing, are actually caused by at least three different kinds of physical processes. With a sample size of six, it's really hard to speculate. Although, no astronomer has ever really been deterred from speculating by small numbers. Here's to hoping that when Rubin Observatory starts its survey, it will also increase the rate at which we find these weird, weird blue objects. Astronomers kind of live to see weird, weird objects. It's, it's what we're here for. And I have to admit to having a favorite Ada Carina. While likely always visible to humans, this southern hemisphere star transformed from a kind of meh star to the second brightest star in the sky during a dramatic event that was observed in 1840. It then faded entirely from unaided view before slowly increasing in brightness to be easily seen again with the unaided eye. I'm totally here for stars being dramatic. And when we look at Eta Carina with modern telescopes like Hubble, we find the eruption of 1840 led to one hell of a glow up. Surrounding the point of light we see with our eyes is a remarkable double lobed nebula that we now understand is expanding away from not just one, but two stars. And these stars are big, approximately 90 and 30 times the mass of the sun. And somehow in 1840-ish, they shed an even more remarkable 10 to 45 solar masses of material. We don't have a firm understanding of what happened, but with every passing year, we're better able to say what resulted. This is because we can actually watch the nebula evolve over time. In a newly released video of data from the Chandra X-ray Observatory, we can watch how the nebula has expanded and the stars have together grown more luminous over the past 20 years. The expanding ring we see in X-rays is actually large enough to surround the beautiful nebula Hubble sees. According to researcher Michael Kokorin, quote, we've interpreted this faint X-ray shell as the blast wave from the great eruption in the 1840s. It tells an important part of Ada Karina's backstory that we wouldn't otherwise have known, end quote. Researchers now believe the great eruption consisted of two explosions. The first was made of low density gas that expanded out, creating what we now see as an X-ray ring. While the other was slower and made of dense material that makes that visible nebula that we enjoy looking at so very much. These observations are described in a paper that was led by Nathan Smith. Up next, we're going to look at satellites and all the bad they have the potential to do. Stay tuned. This week's Closer Look goes where I haven't really wanted to go before. We are going to look at the impacts of the growing number of satellites like Starlinks on our ability to safely live our lives and 
to astronomy. This closer look is brought to you by doom scrolling and thus finding an FAA report in the middle of the night that I regret finding. According to the FAA, given the expected growth in satellites, coupled with the fact that satellites do very literally fall out of space through the atmosphere and sometimes fall all the way to the earth, given all of these things, by the year 2035, we can expect one person could be killed or injured every two years by satellites as they descend back toward Earth. Folks, I did not have satellite debris on my list of possible ways to die. Turns out, I lack imagination. The report, delivered to Congress on September 22nd, is titled Risk Associated with Re-Entry Disposal of Satellites from Proposed Large Constellations in Low Earth Orbit. And per its executive summary, Quote, it informs Congress of ways the FAA's launch and re-entry licensing process may be leveraged to address the risk from re-entering space debris, end quote. Put another way, they are explaining how they hope to do their best to prevent people from getting killed or injured by space debris. And that may mean companies can't do exactly what they want to do. They are also explaining why their best really isn't enough, given that more nations than the U.S. are filling space. And a company can always just go elsewhere if the FAA doesn't license them the way they'd like to be licensed. I want to read you a section of the report. It is utterly dry, but the meaning is alarming. Quote, by 2035, if the expected large constellation growth is realized and debris from Starlink satellites survive re-entry, the total number of hazardous fragments surviving re-entries each year is expected to reach 28,000. And the casualty expectation, the number of individuals on the ground predicted to be injured or killed by debris surviving the re-entries of satellites being disposed from these constellations, would be 0.6 per year, which means that one person on the planet would be expected to be injured or killed every two years. Some debris fragments would also be a hazard to people in aircraft. Projecting 2019 global air traffic to 2035 and assuming that a fragment that would injure or kill a person on the ground also would be capable of fatally damaging an aircraft. The probability of an aircraft downing accident, defined in the aerospace report as a collision with an aircraft downing object in 2035, would be 0.007 per year. End quote. These are extremely low odds. But this is information we didn't have before. And as we assess the need for multitudes of competing companies launching greater multitudes of tiny, potentially killer satellites, it's important to ask, can't we all just work together? Share the constellations? I know the answer is no. But as a scientist who has seen the success of international collaborations like CERN, I'm kind of required to ask the question and then move along. While the FAA was doing the report on how both the rockets that launch satellites and the satellites themselves can potentially do random humans harm, astronomers have been busy specifically looking at how different constellations of satellites can wreck our ability to do survey science. Like all that cool stuff I'm anxious to see Rubin Observatory do. Consider the Blue Walker 3 satellite, developed by AST Space Mobile. It is a prototype for a new constellation of Bluebird satellites that will provide cell signals with normal ground-based phones. 
This is possible thanks to the satellite's remarkable size, which allows it to generate significant amounts of power it can then use to send out astronomically strong 3G cell signals. The large size of these satellites means they are bright. During a 130-day survey, an IAU observing campaign monitored the brightness and at the brightest point in this orbit, the Blue Walker 3 satellite appeared as bright as the brightest stars in the sky. These observations are described in a new paper in the journal Nature, led by Shangitha Nandakarum. AST Space Mobile has requested permission to operate 243 satellites in 16 orbital planes. This combination of an extremely bright visual appearance and a powerful cellular transmitter has the potential to hit astronomy in both the optical and radio wavelengths. Images that contain the satellite, images that may be many minute long exposures, will have to be thrown out and repeated. This means more images will need to be taken to accomplish the same science, just at a slower rate. According to the research paper, quote, the expected build out of constellations with hundreds of thousands of new bright objects will make active satellite tracking and avoidance strategies a necessity for ground-based telescopes. We have to steer our pointing of telescopes around the satellites. To many, the concerns raised by these satellites go well beyond just the science and the potential danger. Dave Clements, who was part of the campaign to observe Blue Walker 3, explains, quote, The night sky is a unique laboratory that allows scientists to conduct experiments that cannot be done in terrestrial laboratories. Astronomical observations have provided insights into fundamental physics and other research at the boundaries of our knowledge and changed humanity's view of our place in the cosmos. The pristine night sky is also an important part of humanity's shared cultural heritage and should be protected for the society at large and for future generations." End quote. When people start invoking the importance of something for future generations, it's important to ask, where is the good? In this case, that means trying to balance the potential benefits of low Earth orbit satellite communication against the potential harm of those same satellites. There is clearly a need to have some kind of a service that can provide internet to remote locations at a cost that a mountaintop forestry service station or a remote town's library can afford. We are better off when more people have access to the internet, from education to e-commerce to disaster mitigation. There is a clear good served when small villages can have the same bandwidth as large cities. So how do we balance the good of internet access against the bad of a light-filled sky? I, I can't pretend to know all the answers. This is a new error with new problems we are just starting to try and get a handle on. The first Starlinks only launched in 2019 and we were all pretty distracted by the pandemic there for a while. But while we don't have answers, there are hints at things to look at, things to consider. The FAA report points out, without actually pointing out, at one place to start. While the FAA can't control the licenses on launches from other nations, we can, as a planet, work together to not create too much orbital chaos. There are already international agreements about registering vehicles, and there are suggested guidelines on how spacecraft should have end-of-mission plans so we don't 
fill space with defunct hardware. These guidelines are a start, and it may be time for tough talk on how we navigate forward as humanity instead of as myriad spacefaring nations and companies all working in competition. Yeah, I know. Right now, there are harder problems that need to be sorted, but we need to pay attention and make sure we don't let space get completely filled before we sort out how to launch things safely. Right now, that means making sure this upcoming problem stays on the to-solve list, even if it is stuck down towards the very bottom of the to-solve list. The other thing we need to work on is mitigation techniques. Currently, there are over 50,000 pieces of orbital debris being actively tracked, as well as 170 million smaller pieces that cannot be tracked and can endanger anything they hit. If we're just going to keep launching satellites by the hundreds, we need a way to start cleaning the current debris and preventing future debris. We've talked in the past about potential missions that will grab satellites and debris to clean up space. The catch is that those missions need to know very precisely where the debris is located so that they can navigate to it and gather it up. Helping provide that extra information is a planned swarm of small satellites that will fly together and have a distributed suite of instruments that allow them to measure the Earth's changing atmosphere and magnetic fields and more. By measuring how space weather affects the swarm, we should be able to better predict how satellites in general will have their orbits modified by the space environment. Just like knowing rain will slow your commute home, these satellites will help us know how drag from an expanding atmosphere might lower satellite and change when it passes overhead or within reach of that debris gathering mission. Rules, observations, information, collaboration, it's all going to be needed. And finally, we also need to make sure there are actual penalties when companies screw up. In early October, the FCC fined DISH Network $150,000 for failing to move a satellite into an appropriate graveyard orbit. By leaving a dead satellite in a frequently used part of orbit, they increase the potential of collisions. While $150,000 doesn't represent that much money to a company with a nearly $17 billion of revenue per year, at least there was a penalty. It's a start. I'm not sure how I feel about this satellite-filled future we're headed toward. But I do know it kept our aerospace correspondent, Eric Mattis, busy for the past week. After a break, we'll be back to discuss all the news from the launch pad. We have a whole lot of rocket news. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome on aerospace correspondent Eric Mattis for this week's Tales from the Launch Pad. Hey, Eric. Hi, Pamela. A whole lot has happened since our last show, including a new Spanish rocket launch and the successful return to flight of the Vega rocket for Europe. First up, however, is the inaugural launch of the latest Starlink competitor, Amazon's Project Kuiper protoflight, on October 6th. The New Glenn and Ariane 6 rockets that will launch most of the Constellation are still preparing for flight, so Amazon had to use one of its nine contracted Atlas V rockets to launch its two prototype satellites, which were originally manifested to launch on a much smaller RS-1 rocket made by ABL Space Systems. That rocket failed its inaugural launch after only a few seconds, and ABL Space Systems is still ref working on return to flight. Two further prototypes were to go on the inaugural launch of ULA's Vulcan rocket, but delays with Vulcan resulted in the use of the Atlas V. ULA shut down the Atlas V production line to focus on Vulcan, so there are only 17 Atlas V left, and they're all booked, being split between more Kuiper satellites and sending Boeing Starliner to the ISS. 
Despite it being a run-of-the-mill communication satellite, Amazon treated this mission with a level of secrecy normally associated with a classified NRO launch. Before launch, they only posted photos of the satellite shipping containers and only allowed ULA to post a mission timeline up to seconds of ignition and the mission's live webcast was ended at this point as well, with the commentator stating that this was due to the request of the customer, just like on NRO launches. After separation, the second stage performed a burn to escape Earth orbit after separation. The only acknowledged payloads on the mission were the two satellites. Amateur satellite trackers only found these payloads in orbit, dispelling a rumor that was a secret payload or two in the X's payload capacity. On October 7th, a Spanish company named PLD Space launched their first rocket, Mira Run, from a spaceport in southwest Spain. The launch was scheduled for the evening, and it lifted off at the beginning of the window. The planned height of the suborbital test was 80 kilometers, but this was changed before flight to 50 kilometers, following a trajectory change that put the rocket over the ocean earlier in flight for safety reasons. The change was not communicated to the public before launch, which led to some confusion into a post-flight update. They attempted a recovery of the stage from the water, and while the parachute did deploy properly, the first stage hit the ocean sideways, filled with water, and sank. Other than that, the flight was perfect, according to PLD Space. Besides proving the engine technology, one of the goals was to gather data on the environment inside the spacecraft, both during launch and during microgravity. The data will be used to refine Mira 5, the reusable orbital launch vehicle they're developing. Mira 5 will have a maximum payload capacity of 450 kilograms and is intended for delivering everything from keypads to larger scientific satellites to low Earth orbit. This was the second attempt to launch Mira 1. The first attempt was back in May, but was scrubbed due to a minor problem with tension on the cable that retracts one of the umbilicals before launch. Due to the risk of wildfires at the launch site in southwestern Spain, it didn't make a second attempt until early October. In the evening of October 9th, Ariane Space launched VB-23, the first Vega rocket in almost a year, from the Guiana Space Center in Kourou, French Guiana. On board were Taos-2, an Earth observation satellite owned by the government Thailand, and Triton, also known as former Sat-7R, a weather satellite owned by the Taiwan Space Agency. There were also 10 CubeSats, including some built by students in a number of different countries. While the launch itself was successful and the two primary satellites were deployed successfully, it was announced a few days after launch that two of the 10 CubeSats failed to deploy from the mechanism that ejects CubeSats into orbit. This isn't a problem with the Vega rocket, which has its own growing pains, but a side note from an otherwise successful launch. Last but not least, on October 13th, NASA's Psyche asteroid mission was launched atop a Falcon Heavy from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The launch was delayed several times due to weather and once due to a technical problem with the spacecraft. Engineers discovered quite late in the process that there was a problem with the settings for the spacecraft RCS thrusters, the small rocket engines that move the spacecraft around once in space. The concern was they would get too hot, so the control software was changed to reduce their thrust by 70%. The original plan when the mission was awarded in 2020 was to have an all-new Falcon Heavy and land the boosters downrange on both East Coast drone ships. Since then, SpaceX has launched almost 200 reused booster flights, so the mission profile was changed to accommodate SpaceX's launch schedule. This meant that the boosters returned to the landing pad, eliminating the need to use the drone ships. Launch day had calm skies, which is always good for launching rockets. The clouds of oxygen vapor vending from the launch vehicle stuck around the rocket before liftoff, obscuring the rocket until ignition. The launch was nominal, as were the booster landings. The landings were staggered by over 10 seconds, which is a greater spacing than the previous Falcon Heavy missions. After a 45-minute coast, the Falcon Heavy second stage relit to send the Psyche spacecraft towards its March flyby in 2026. Shortly after, it called home to JPL, confirming a successful launch. The spacecraft is scheduled to rendezvous with asteroid 16 Psyche in 2029, and it will bring you periodic updates on its journey to the asteroid here on EVSN. In addition to the launches we just told you about, there was also a Chinese launch on October 14th, and three Starlink launches since our last show. We keep track of orbital launches by launch site, also called Spaceport. According to Rocket Launch.Live, so far this year, the USA has had 84 launches, China 47, 
India and Kazakhstan, each of at 7, New Zealand and Russia, each of at 6, French Guiana and Japan, each of at 3, North Korea, Iran, Israel, South Korea, and the United Kingdom, each of at 1. Of these 169 launches, there have been 8 failures, reminding us that space is hard. Thanks, Eric. Before we go, I have one final story straight out of those in search of mysteries I loved as a child. About 12,800 years ago, the Earth underwent a period of cooling following the end of the last ice age. Essentially, things warmed up, a whole lot of stuff melted, and then things cooled down a bit. Most researchers believe this was caused by a shutdown of the mid-ocean conveyor belts, a set of currents that carry warm equatorial water north and return cold Arctic water south. This kind of a shutdown, as we may be experiencing today, can occur when too much fresh water enters the Atlantic, such as when glaciers melt. There are, however, a not very quiet cadre of scientists who instead think there is sufficient evidence of an asteroid or comet exploding in the atmosphere that we should consider a close call with a celestial object as the actual cause of that cooling. This is called the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis. In a suite of four papers presented at the Science Open Airbursts and Cratering Impacts Conference, researchers combine geophysical and archaeological data to lay out their case. While I am not enough of an expert in these fields to discuss the validity of their airburst hypothesis against the validity of the ocean currents explanation, I am amused that they can show very clearly that before the event, folks were hunter-gatherers, and afterward, populations were smaller and more focused on dom domesticated crops and livestock. This means, potentially, a comet caused agriculture to be developed, or ocean currents, or something. And now I really want a sci-fi story where instead of a comet ending civilization, it creates it. Can you write that, someone, please? Anyways, that's it for now. Good night, everyone, and remember, go outside and look up.